Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about freeway merging, how to do it safely, how to do it correctly, so that you can get on the freeway and not conflict with traffic already on the highway. Stick around, we'll be right back with that information. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about highway merging, freeways, interstates, and motorways for those of you who are in Europe. Yes, all of these techniques will work. So if you're just tuning in to Smart Drive Test here, let us know where you're tuning in from in the world and what class of license that you're going for. To uh, Tommy is here from Oshawa. Cody, already liked the video. Thank you, Cody. Uh, excellent, Mike, yourself. And where are you tuning in from? Yeah, I do have a bit of marks on my face. <laughs> <laughs> left over from Bra Brazilian Jiu Jitsu this week but they are healing up so uh, Cody did freeway driving today that's excellent and Shamil is here from Texas and Shamil is endeavoring on opening a driving school for CDL drivers there in Texas in Dallas Texas that's excellent congratulations on that endeavor that is awesome so that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have any other questions about passing a road test, passing a CDL license as well, becoming a bus or truck driver or air brakes, we can help you with all of that as well. And of course, spring is coming uh, with motorcycles and those types of things. And Cody is in North Vancouver working towards a class five license, which is passenger vehicle here in British Columbia. And just before we get started here, uh, unfortunately, I had a smart driver here in British Columbia that was unsuccessful on a road test and was of the belief that she or he had been tricked by the driving examiner. And I just want to reiterate that for the most part, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, driving examiners are not going to trick you. And the reason that driving examiners are not going to trick you is, is because they know that you don't have a high level of experience with the vehicle that you're testing on as well they know that you're nervous and they know that there's a lot of adrenaline so they're not going to trick you now saying that it is your job as the student taking a test to demonstrate to the examiner that you have due care and control of the vehicle in changing traffic situations and what I mean by tra changing traffic situations is that the driving examiner may say something to you, like for example, to turn right at the next intersection or to merge left. And in the very instant that they say that, the traffic situation changes so that it is no longer safe for you to do that. When they looked and saw the gap, the vehicle behind them may have sped up if you're making a lane change, for example, and then you can't get in there, right? And if you can't get in there, then it's up to you to safely make that lane change. Just because the driving examiner gave you directions, doesn't mean that you have to do it right away. You do it when it's safe. So again, your job on a road test is to demonstrate to the examiner that you have due care and control of the vehicle in changing traffic situations, all right? So Vanessa is here uh, from Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada here. Uh, don't know if she's from Winnipeg, but she's from Manitoba. <laughs> I just assumed that, sorry. Uh, Hillbilly in Philly, I looked to give donation but could not figure out how to on the channel. Uh, you can go over to the 100K campaign, uh, Hillbilly, there and make a donation on the, uh, there. And uh, Corey's here. Corey's here. Uh, Bricks for Wheels. Uh, Corey will put the link up for the 100K campaign. You can make a donation there if you'd like. All right. Uh, Vanessa, I took my road test this past week on March 13th and failed because I failed to stop properly. I rolled through a stop sign so my next road test is April 24th so you're gonna be excellent you're gonna do fine on next uh, go there okay uh, Corey bricks for wheels and Colin is here traveling gaming he's been here excellent we're all doing well thank you so much Tommy Lund Vanessa uh, two hours north of Winnipeg okay so she's in remote uh, Manitoba there <laughs> excellent uh, Jonathan, hello Rick and everyone from New York City. It has, uh, anyone has questions, feel free to post and I will do my best to answer your questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Christina, I have my license for 10 months and I'm still afraid to drive on highways. How can I get rid of this fear? I'm from uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, and there in Harris, Pens Harrisburg, you're going to be merging onto freeways and those types of things, Christina. And basically, Christina, uh, what I'll do is I'm going to revisit this question after I do the presentation. I'm just going to move over to the presentation, Christina, and that might give you some information. Just 
uh, after I'm finished the presentation, let's go back to that question and I'll, I'll definitely help you with it at that point and give you some ideas about uh, reducing some of your fear and anxiety and overcoming that challenge of driving on highways. But I'll just get over to the presentation here and we'll go through that and then we'll come back to this. All right. So today we're going to talk about freeway merging. Uh, for new drivers, this can be very intimidating. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. And uh, as you saw the video there about 10 days ago that I put up where unfortunately a new driver here on the channel was very gracious in giving me dash cam footage of a rear end crash that uh, that smart driver had experienced. And it shows you one of the things that you should not do on, on ramps and unfortunately was not successful. Okay. Oop. Okay, what am I missing here? There we go. There we go. Okay, I got it now. There we go. So this is the video that I would suggest you have a look at. Uh, it's rear end crash on and on ramp getting onto the freeway and the techniques and skills that you can put in place to prevent rear ending other vehicles. And essentially it comes back to space management. You want lots of space in front of your vehicle. Uh, and reading the signs uh, from other traffic that tells you that in fact the vehicles in front of you are uh, tailgating and that you need to manage space and put a lot more space between you and those other vehicles. So I've had lots of comments uh, about merging onto freeways and one of the things that I say on the uh, in the video on freeway merging is, is that you need to get onto the on-ramp and you need to put your foot in it and you need to get your vehicle up to highway speed. Now probably one of the things that I was ignorant in or that I was negligent in, in uh, saying was is that you need to pick your gap. If there's bumper to bumper traffic and you get up to highway speed, uh, you're not going to get in there because there's no gap. You need to figure your gap out and you need to aim for that gap, gap and you need to make adjustments as you're coming out on the on-ramp and on the acceleration lane. But you need it's imperative that you get up to highway speed, so you got to get your foot into it. And unfortunately, the rear end crash in the video that I just showed you here previously uh, what happened was is that the lead car, there were three cars in a row there, the lead car stopped before the acceleration lane and this is what uh, caused the rear end crash and so it wasn't really the driver's fault uh, that it happened. It was a bit of inexperience that it caused the crash but it was also the fact that the other driver did something unpredictable and stopped on the acceleration lane which sometimes happens. Alright, so if you're new to Smart Drive Test, Smart Drive Test helps new drivers get a license veteran drivers to remain crash free and CDL drivers to start a career as a truck or bus driver and I'm Rick August. I was a truck driver through most of the 1990s. I became a licensed driving uh, commercial driving instructor in 1997. Uh, most of my experience has been with uh, tractor trailers, buses and I have an expertise in teaching air brakes and there is the uh, air brake explained simply manual over at the Smart Drive Test website that you can pick up as well and it has a hundred air brake practice test questions in it and it is guaranteed to help you pass your CDL air brakes. Uh, in 2006 I graduated from the University of Melbourne with a doctorate in legal history and it's in uh, policing as it relates to traffic. For those of you who don't know, legal history is the study of policing, courts and prisons and my expertise is in policing. And while I was in Australia uh, going to university I drove buses for Greyhound and for V-Line, one of the regional uh, the bus lines there uh, in Melbourne, Australia. So if you want to know more about that, you can head over to the website and look under the menu item, uh, contact us and you'll find a biography that I've written over there and give you more information about who I am. So yes, so today we're talking about merging onto an interstate, a freeway, highway, uh, any uh, limited access highway. And yes, for new drivers, this can be incredibly intimidating because the analogy that I have in terms of merging onto the freeway is that it's a little bit like learning how to uh, skate and do a hockey stop. There's really no explanation of how to do a hockey stop. It's just, uh, you just kind of have to commit. And it's the same thing with merging onto a freeway. You have to commit, but there are techniques and skills that you can put in place that will keep you safe. First and foremost, you need to manage space in front of your vehicle. You need to manage the space behind your vehicle because one of the comments on the video last week was that if you back off too much and you have too much space in front of your vehicle, the vehicles behind you are going to be tailgating and they potentially could run into you. But as one smart driver commented, you just basically tap your brake lights and that will indicate to the vehicles behind you what you're doing, that you're you know, creating a buffer of space so that you can get up to speed and merge onto the highway. And of course, merging brings all four components 
of driving together at the same time and this is why a lot of drivers uh, new drivers especially find this intimidating because you have to manage speed you have to manage your space you have to observe and you have to observe laterally which a lot of drivers find difficult because looking to the side judging gap is not something that we do we generally tend to judge gap in a linear motion so it's either in front of us or behind us it's much easier in front of us but to the side drivers find that very difficult to observe and determine gap uh, to the side and then finally you have to communicate and you have to communicate well obviously the position of your vehicle on the acceleration ramp indicates that you're going to be merging out on the freeway but you have to have your signal on from the time you get on the on-ramp all the way out onto the acceleration lane because other vehicles are not going to slow down or move over to another lane if they can unless you're telling them that you're going to merge out onto the freeway highway or interstate and you need to do that so it's imperative that you communicate early and you communicate effectively and continue to do that now I want to say and reiterate the onus of responsibility for merging is on the merging driver however I do say to drivers that are on the highway if you can you know slow down simply take your foot off the throttle slow down three or four miles an hour oftentimes that's enough for the merging driver to get up to speed and get out in front of you and get on the, the highway freeway or interstate as well if you can move over when vehicles are merging out onto the highway that is even better because then that clears a path for the merging vehicles to get out onto the freeway unimpeded and sometimes it's just simple moving over to the other lane and the other thing uh, as I was saying previously that if the merging driver is uh, proactive and communicates effectively that gives drivers out on the highway lots of time to move over and as well as you're driving on the freeway you want to be looking for the off ramps you want to be looking for the on ramps and watching for merging traffic that is going to allow you to be more proactive and more pro pro predictable and everybody's going to be safe because this will help everybody out because as I say merging tends to be a bit of a team sport and you know unfortunately I got a lot of people on the on the channel who come on here and it's like oh it's not I'm not moving over and I'm not doing this and yes if you're driving a larger vehicle some of that I can understand but for the most part uh, you know a lot of times if traffic's not heavy then you can move over you can slow down and even if traffic is heavy as long as you match the speed of the traffic on the highway eventually somebody's gonna slow down and somebody's gonna let you in as long as you're indicating with your signal that you're gonna move over it will happen uh, they have no choice but to let you over all right so speed management as I said as you're coming out on the on-ramp you'll be looking out on the highway pick your gap and manage your speed if there's a big truck out there on the highway that you need to either merge in front of or merge in behind you need to get your foot on the pedal and you need to make a decision about whether you're gonna merge in front of that truck or behind that truck and you need to sometimes you're just gonna have to mash it down especially if you got a car with a small four-cylinder in it uh, you need to put it right on the floor <laughs> get that sucker going and if you're a new driver if you're a learning driver this is something you want to do with a veteran driver you want to do it with a driving instructor or some other professional uh, if you haven't put the pedal to the metal before and don't know what's going to happen especially in an automatic vehicle it could be a little intimidating because you've got the sound you've got the shifting of the transmission down into the passing gear oftentimes the automatic transmissions will shift down into second gear to get as much uh, to maximize acceleration as much as possible so if you haven't done it then get somebody to go out with you and do it and, ha and show you how to do that if you're driving a manual transmission I know in my five-speed Honda CRV when I'm merging out onto the highway if I want to get a lot of acceleration as quickly as possible oftentimes I'll just leave it in third gear and just mash on it and I'll run it out to 5,000 rpm and it'll get up to 110 kilometers an hour in a very very short period of time so that's one of the other things that you want to do when you get out onto the on-ramp okay communicate signal as early as possible when you're on the on-ramp put your signal on leave your signal on completely uh, uh, the whole time until you're completely in the lane uh, if you don't have daylight running lights turn your lights on this will allow other traffic to be able to see you you can see here in the image that all the vehicles have their lights on and they've done tons and tons of studies to show that uh, vehicles with lights on are much more visible and that you know other traffic is more likely to give you space and manage space uh, if you're trying to merge out onto a highway interstate or freeway and if you're driving a big truck a loaded truck as I often used to do if you're running 80,000 pounds plus 40 tons 
uh, and you get out onto the on-ramp, you want to put your four-way flashers on and you want to simply focus on getting as much speed as possible when you hit the freeway because if you're merging out onto a 100 kilometer an hour freeway, you can be almost guaranteed that the traffic flow is 110. You want to try to get 60 kilometers an hour plus by the time you get out onto the freeway. And let me tell you, if you got a big truck, you got four ways going on it, and you come down to the end of the acceleration lane and you start moving over, those cars are going to slow down or move over to the other lane and they're going to let you in. All right? Shoulder checking. You need to hold your course. You need to be shoulder checking even before you get onto the acceleration lane. And it's a quick, sharp head turn. Don't be staring out at the freeway because unfortunately, uh, if you're staring out at the freeway, you're going to miss what's going on in front of you. And again, what happened to the smart driver was is that the vehicle in front stopped, didn't see it, and therefore caused a rear end collision. So it's a quick, sharp look if you're a uh, 90 degree turn. Quickly identify your gap and then aim for that gap using your speed and adjusting your speed so you can do that. As well, the other thing you might want to consider is getting convex mirrors for your vehicle and that will help you out as well to see a bigger field of vision out to the sides of your vehicles. All right, observation, you want to be looking, you want to be seeing where your gap is going to be. You want to aim for that space and you want to watch the traffic in front of you on the acceleration lane to make sure that the traffic in front of you isn't in fact stopping. Now, here is something else that is something that happens in the United States of America is that they have these on ramps that don't even <laughs> have an acceleration lane and then at the bottom they have a stop sign. Well, you can't stop there. You need to get some speed up because the traffic on the highway is moving at speed. And studies have shown that cars are more likely to get tailgated when they're stopped as opposed to moving. So you do want to try and use this on-ramp to get a bit of speed up and just, you know, I'm not saying ignore the stop sign, but these are kind of, you know, these are odd situations that the Americans have simply not figured out. I, I'm not saying that these don't exist in Canada, but they tend to be less likely. They tend to be more a product of the United States of America and they tend to happen there every now and again in different places. I mean, they are getting around to eliminating most of these, but every now and again they are there, and if anybody's watching on the replay and you know a place where this is, please send me the address and then I can put that on the website and, and help people out with that. All right, and then space management, you gotta watch the vehicle in front of you, keep on the acceleration and keep your distance. And you can see here that the car in the image here has come right out to the end of the acceleration lane behind this big truck. And basically, there's probably a big gap in behind this big truck, and this car could have just let off the throttle and merged in behind this big truck, and that would have been the best option for that merging driver. So manage your space on the acceleration lane, and if you're running out of space, do something. Let off the throttle. Get over. Uh, you know, because somebody's going to let you in. They're not, they're not just going to run you off the end of the ramp. That doesn't happen very often. I know that people who are driving in L.A. or they're driving in New York or they're driving in Philadelphia or some other place is gonna say, oh yeah, when it gets busy, people won't let you in. Uh, I've driven all over the United States of America and all of these metropolitan cities and people, you know, as a rule, if you're getting on the throttle and, and communicating well, they're not gonna run you off the road. All right, so good luck on your road test. Remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. So we'll pop back over here. There we go, and we'll start answering some questions. We're gonna come back to the other question as well. Uh, Okay, all right, so there we go, there we go, there we go. So Corey's put up my, bi bi my biography if you're interested in having a look at that as well. So, um, okay, just catching up here on the conversation. Okay, so Christina saying she took her test 10 months ago and I have to drive every day to work and that makes me scared every day because I have to drive on a highway. Now, Christina, when you're saying driving on a highway, are you talking about an interstate? Is that what you're referring to when you're mentioning highway? Uh, just let me know there. Okay. Uh, Grace, thanks for the tips. Uh, go overcome my fears. My worst fear is missing an exit. We'll use these tips and start my driving school yesterday. Okay, Grace. One of the things that I will give you expert, expert, the, the best tip you can have for not missing your exit, know, uh, know your mile marker numbers because oftentimes the mile marker numbers, unless you're in the state of New York or somewhere else, most of the time the mile marker numbers are going to coincide with the exits. And 
So for example, if you're getting off at exit 68 and you watch the mile marker numbers and you know you're at exit 67, you know you have one mile from where you are to your exit that you need to get into the right hand lane in preparation to exit off the freeway. So I cannot stress this enough uh, that you know the mile marker numbers along the interstates, along the highways. For example, I'll tell you a story. We were driving a big truck in Kamloops, British Columbia here, and I was with a student and we're going up the interstate and we were getting off at exit 68. So we come on the interstate at, at exit 72. And for those of you who've been to Kamloops, British Columbia, you know that when you're heading west towards Vancouver that you go up over a big hill. And so we're in a big truck, we're coming up the hill and there's a set of Super Bs in front of us. And a set of Super Bs is two trailers on the back of a big truck and it's loaded. And these Super Bs run out at 140,000 pounds. So obviously that truck is going slower than what we're going. So the, the student says to me, he says, can I pa do I have enough room to pass the truck before we get to our exit? And, and so I realized very quickly that the student didn't know what mile markers were. And I said to the student, I said, what, do you know what mile markers? And the student said, no, I don't. And I said, okay, so what mile marker did we get off at? Because we'd gone over the route planning before we left in the big truck. And so the student said to me, he said, well, we got on at exit 72. I said, yes. And I said, which one are we getting off at? And he said, well, we're getting off at exit 68. And I said, so what's the difference between 72 and 68? And he didn't know, and I, because he didn't understand mile markers. And I said, well, the difference is four kilometers. I said, you have to go down the road four kilometers before you get off at your exit. I said, do you have enough time to pass this truck in front of us? And he said, well, yeah, I do, because I have four kilometers. So if you know your mile markers and you know the exact exit that you're going to get off at, so you know that you're getting on the freeway at exit 72 and you need to get off at 68, you know that you have four kilometers or four miles because in the state in the United States it's gonna be four miles, then it's gonna be a defensive measure as well because you know the exact distance before you have to get over into the right-hand lane. So for grace, when you have nerves about which exit you're going to get off at just go on Google look at the exact number of the exit that you need to get off at and then when you're going down the freeway you can say okay I got four miles to go before my exit I got three miles I got two miles I got one mile and if I, you know it's one mile between where you're positioned at on the freeway to the time that you get off that's going to reduce your anxiety and your frustration because you know that you need to get over in that right hand lane and you know exactly that the next exit is going to be the exit that you get off at. So that is one of the things that's going to help you tremendously in reducing your stress. Okay, so Grace, you're in Canada. Okay, so um, whereabouts in Canada are you? Because it works the same in Canada. We have mile markers here in Canada as well, especially if you're on the Trans-Canada Highway. Okay. Um, All right, so Vanessa, I've merged before even on my road test and I seem to think I'm okay, but this week on Wednesday, I will be buying my first vehicle, so I'll have more driving around to practice. Excellent, congratulations on getting your first vehicle, Vanessa, that's very exciting. Uh, Tommy in Connecticut, there are some on-ramps are short and you have to yield. Yes, Tommy, I will say that, that as I said, the onus of responsibility is on the merging vehicle and they will have those yield signs, but that doesn't mean you should stop, <laughs> don't stop. Get on the on-ramp and go get your vehicle up so you match the flow of traffic on the freeway. Don't stop on the on-ramp unless you want to risk being rear-ended. I cannot stress that enough. And I, I've had a couple of drivers, uh, smart drivers ask me this week, do it in rush hour traffic. Well, I'm going down to the States this week. I'm going to Seattle, so I'm hoping that I can get out in some rush hour traffic and I can do a few merges out onto the interstate when it's busy and I'll bring that video for you and try and get that up for you okay and show you how to do that okay okay Tommy I find the more time I spend driving on a particular highway the more comfortable I get with driving on in terms of merging etc yes and it, it's what happens uh, Tommy the more you do it the more you're gonna get comfortable okay so Christina yes it is in fact an interstate and yes in fact it will have mile markers and Corey's put the video up there on how to navigate and route plan and that will go through step by step on showing you how to go on Google, how to route plan to a destination, how to figure out where the exit numbers are and those types of things. And that will help you out uh, in terms of being able to drive on an interstate, on a motorway, on a freeway, and that will make you more comfortable, okay? 
Uh, Philly, local CDL schools test in 47 foot, but how high is the standard trailer? All right, Philly. <laughs> you must know this and put this in your brain. You must put this in your brain. Okay, CDL drivers. <laughs> Maximum width, 102 inches, which is eight feet, six inches, okay? Maximum width, 2.6 meters, yes. Okay, you don't need to know that. That's not really important. The, this is the important piece. The important piece that you need to put in your brain, as I just see myself on the screen there saying that, 13 feet, six inches. 13 feet, six inches in Canada, in metric, 4.15 meters. You must absolutely know that bit of information. When you're driving a large vehicle, 13 feet, six inches, 4.15 feet. 4.15 meters, sorry. <laughs> I'll just say it one more time so everybody has it. Driving a large vehicle, RVs, buses, trucks, 4.15 meters, 13 feet, six inches. And there's a video that Corey will get for you here on overhead clearances that you must absolutely know. Now, the one thing that is going to screw you up is the state of New York. For whatever reason, uh, New York is the only state that measures from the center of the hub to the top of the unit. They don't measure from the ground up. So there are some bridges and overpasses in the state of New York that are 12 feet 6 inches that you can go under, which will just really mess with your head if you're a CDL driver. Okay, So again, height for oversized vehicles, 13 feet 6 inches maximum. 4.15 meters all right that's what you absolutely must know <laughs> when you're driving a big vehicle all right um, yes and Philly yes most of them are yield so and again it means that the onus of responsibility for merging is on the merging driver that's what that means but you still need to get out on the on-ramp you need to get it up to speed and you need to get it going all right uh, Yes, and we'll just, since Tommy just mentioned this again about missing exits. All right, if you're in the middle lane and you come up and you see, oh my God, there's my exit, please do not do just like crean over into the front of other traffic and move off the interstate, okay? That is incredibly dangerous. It's better to go down to the next exit, get off the exit, because oftentimes it's just a matter of getting off the exit making a left turn, coming back on the freeway, and then exiting, coming back around. So you just come back around. That is way, way safer than just plowing into the other lane of traffic and then getting off at your exit. It's not a big deal. There are a few places in the United States, in my experience, <laughs> New Jersey for one, uh, that you cannot just simply get off the exit, go over and come back up the freeway. Uh, but for the most part, I would say 85, 90% of the time, if you miss your exit, just go down to the next exit, get off, make a left turn, come back on the interstate, come back to the exit and then get off. You can do that. Um, but again, there are a few places now, especially in this day and age, it's not a huge deal if you got your phone with you because you can use the GPS and the nice thing about the GPS is the GPS will reroute you. As soon as you get off on somewhere, it'll reroute you and bring you back. So in my day and age, it wasn't like that. Uh, we were driving big trucks with pay phones and maps. So uh, it's a lot better in this day and age. All right. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so Christina, that's one of the things that you can do. So definitely look at the mile markers and that will really help you out with your merging and getting off on your exits and those types of things, okay? So use that uh, in terms of merging and whatnot. All right, uh, Vanessa, you're most welcome. Um, <laughs> Christina, okay, Christina, one of the, th one of the things uh, I might suggest to you, I don't know whether you've seen the video yet on fear and anxiety, uh, that will help you out. Uh, um, so it's not just missing your exit, Christina. What what else is it that ups that makes you anxious when you're driving? Let's just answer that question for me. Maybe we can we can explore this a little bit more and maybe give you some skills that will help you out. Okay, Odie, Dr. Rick, I hope you can uh, tackle topics on what are the light logo symbols on the dashboard means and also how to change tires. Uh, for most of us newbies bad, badly need to know. Yes, I can definitely go over those and put that on the list of topics uh, to cover 
in terms of the lights and symbols on the dashboard that come on for you. Uh, yeah, that would be great. I can I can definitely do that. It's a great topic. <laughs> I'll tell you I'll tell you a story about that. Uh, I was driving coaches in Australia. We had this brand new coach. These you know very expensive highway coaches for Greyhound, and I uh, was doing the overnight. I forget where I was going, but it was the overnight. And anyway, one of the one of the on these newer vehicles, these electronic diesel engines, and your car and those types of things, they talk to you and they have lights on the dashboard and whatnot. And we had a light come on, and I couldn't figure out what the light meant. It was a funny symbol on the dash, and I called dispatch, and I, they put me through to the automotive department. They couldn't figure out what it was, and you know, it just went on and phone call after phone call of talking to people and trying to figure out what it was because the bus just shut down because this light was on. We couldn't figure out what the light was on. Well, after finally an hour or something, uh, dispatch or somebody else had called me, and they said, "Well, did you check the radiator fluid?" And of course, didn't hadn't checked the radiator fluid, and uh, turned out went and put some radiator fluid in it and just dump some water in it and the level come back up, the light went out and sure enough, that's what it was. If the radiator goes down, this light will come on on the dash and the bus will shut down because if there isn't enough fluid in the radiator, uh, the, the, there's a threat that the motor will overheat and it will cause permanent damage. So that's what happens. And yes, if you don't know what the symbols are on the dash, it can be disconcerting when they come on because you don't know what they mean. And especially the oil pressure light, if that comes on while you're driving, you definitely need to shut the vehicle down immediately uh, because you will do permanent damage. All right. Um. <laughs> Philly, GPS not good in Philly. Many 53 foot drivers have to make turns on many bridges. Yeah, and uh, Philly, uh, there are specific uh, GPS for large vehicles and that's the one you want you cannot you know you have to be very careful if you're just using your phone or using a regular GPS and you're driving a large vehicle such as an RV a bus or a truck uh, do not use that <laughs> don't use a regular GPS you have to get the one specifically for CDL truck drivers because that will uh, have all of the low pass low bridges and overpasses uh, logged into it so it doesn't root you on that as well the other thing about the uh, truck driver one the GPS one for specifically for trucks it will also tell you where all the scales are so know that uh, okay all right um, all right so lots of support for Christina um okay driving I just can't control my anxiety okay so Christina one of the things I might suggest to you if, you if your frustration and your anxiety surrounding driving is not abating it's not getting less as you do more and more driving I might suggest that you seek out a professional to talk to about that because it's probably beyond the abilities of what we have to offer here on the channel and it may be something that you need somebody else to help you with and sort of talk you through because it sounds uh it sounds like you know it sounds like your anxiety is pretty high and uh yeah that would be my counsel to you is to, to you know maybe find find somebody that can help you out with those other issues all right uh hall phase how much time could you lose uh well it depends hall phase how much time you would lose it depends whether you go down to the next exit and it's simply a matter of doing a u-turn and coming back up the freeway if that's the issue you're probably going to lose 10 minutes if it's not as simple as going down to the next exit coming around and coming back up uh might be a half an hour or whatnot especially with modern gps it might it probably wouldn't be more than 20 minutes so somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes is all the time that you're going to lose but you sort of need to think 10 to 20 minutes is that really kind of worth my life in terms of cutting off other traffic and whatnot no, it's not. 10 to 20 minutes, you're going to arrive alive, and that's what you want to do. Okay, Odie, my best advice for safe driving, uh, especially young drivers, just what I did. Download all the Smart Sunday discussions of Dr. Rick and have it in your car. Audio background, guaranteed confidence booster. Excellent. Thank you so much, Cody, for that incredible endorsement. Uh, it's really appreciated, for sure. Excellent. Okay, uh, Tommy, another thing I like to do, I watch uh, dash cam videos on YouTube of people driving routes that I can plan to drive, I find that to be helpful when calming my driving anxiety. Excellent. Uh, Cody, I think FIAT stands for Fix It Again, Tony. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. All right, Jonathan, 
Okay, so Jonathan's answering uh, Hall Phase's question. Excellent. Okay. Con, how do I drive the speed limit without feeling pressured by drivers behind me? Okay, Con, are you preparing for a road test or do you have your license already? I need to know that before I answer that question. Okay, Bricks for Wheels, I think Google Maps has filters that could be helpful for trucks. May not be completely adequate, not sure. Uh, no, Corey, I wouldn't suggest that people use Google Maps. As I said, there are specific GPS units that are for truck drivers. And if you're working as a career as a truck or bus driver and you are driving to lots of different places, for example, if you're doing over the road and you're running anything east of the Mississippi, then I would encourage you to spend the money and get one of those GPS units or know that you need to keep your eyes open because there are lots of places. Uh, for example, two years ago when I went back driving truck, I was driving into uh, Edmonton, Alberta and I hadn't been to Edmonton, Alberta before and the GPS unit kept rerouting me. I was using my phone because the GPS unit in the truck broke, but I have enough experience because I drove in the 1990s before we had GPS to look for no truck routes because I knew that I can't drive down there because that's a no truck route or I knew to look at an overpass or a bridge and say, okay, the sign says more than 4.15 meters and I can or cannot drive under there, okay? So I knew all of that. So if you're comfortable with looking for low bridges and overpasses and no truck routes, then that's okay. You can probably get away with just using Google or your phone. But for most newer CDL drivers who are running over the road and running into all of these places that are gonna be new, you, you probably want to invest in the GPS for large vehicles. And I can tell you this from uh, my experience of driving truck, there are 1,500. 1,500, 1,500 low bridges and overpasses in the city of Chicago alone. <laughs> okay, so it might be worth the investment. All right. Okay, uh, Con, thanks. Okay, uh, da, 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 Jonathan Class, ACDL, how much does it cost for a GPS? Uh, most GPS units, Vanessa are only about $120, I think. I don't think they're much more than that. Maybe some of the other smart drivers know what the cost is. Uh, if you're watching on the replay here, just leave a comment down in the comment section, give us some idea what a GPS unit is. Uh, the other thing that I can do is uh, look at them on Amazon and I can put the link uh, down in the description as well to Amazon and to the Smart Drive Test Store and you can look at some of the merchandise that we have over there uh, that you can purchase, uh, okay? So, um, Okay, Jonathan, please don't promote other channels on my channel. Okay, I'm just asking you, don't don't do that. All right, I don't want. Otherwise, I'm I'm gonna stop. Okay, I don't want other channels promoted on my channel. Uh, Corey, can you just hide those for me, please? Okay. Uh, okay, Epic for freeway merging, take extra caution on cloverleaf interchanges. Uh, Pennsylvania, since ramps or entries are merge points, some cases I have to wait on the ramp to merge. Okay, AJ, taking your CDL permit test in April, on April 1st. Excellent, so that's only, you got two weeks to do that. All right, okay. Uh, no worry, Jonathan. I, I think I misread that, so I owe you an apology about that. You weren't you weren't doing what I thought you were doing. My 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 bad. Okay, so uh, CDL permit. Uh, AJ, uh, where are you in the world that you're taking your CDL road test? Uh, and uh, there we go. Okay. All right. So the. We were talking earlier about large vehicles, uh, RVs, uh, trucks, buses. Uh, <laughs> I had a few experiences uh, with overhead clearances. I was in New York State and I was saying previously that New York State is the only state that doesn't measure from the ground to the top of the unit. They measure from the center of the hub and, and I, I don't think they've uh, fixed this problem yet, uh, in terms of New York City and uh, or New York State for that matter. And I was down there and I come up to this bridge in the early morning. Of course, it's rush hour and it says 12 foot 6 inches, right? It's 12 foot 6 or 12 foot 8. And I'm like, man, I can't go under there. Of course, I stop 
I don't drive under the, the low bridge or overpass and uh, <laughs> and of course traffic's backed up behind me and uh, so finally after about five minutes of sitting there and wondering whether the truck was actually going to go over somebody actually got out of their car come up said to me they said you can go under that bridge <laughs> I'm like okay <laughs> so I believe them because they said that lots of vehicles went under there and I just drove really slow and sure enough I went underneath I was able to go underneath the bridge and that's when I learned that in the state of New York if it's 12 6 it's because they measure from the center of the hub not from the ground so that was one of the lessons I had uh, another time I was in Kamloops and I was actually training in Kamloops and we have the Red River Bridge in Kamloops which I did not know uh, whether it was a bridge that you could drive a big truck across uh, because it, on one side of the Red River Bridge is an industrial complex and oftentimes if you have a bridge near an industrial complex you can drive across it with a big truck and uh, <laughs> so I'm driving up to the bridge and we passed the sign that said that you couldn't go on the bridge with big vehicles and you know I'm kind of going really slowly and I'm with a student and I told the student I said I don't know and then finally somebody came up on a motorcycle next to us on the big truck and they said to us you can't go across that bridge in a big truck so of course the traffic's all backed up behind us again and we're with a student and I just said to the student I said listen just put the four ways on and back up the traffic will move out of the way and eventually what happened was is that we just got back to the next road and we just made a left and we just carried on with our life but it can be for those of us driving big trucks RVs and buses and those types of things and you're in unfamiliar areas and you don't know whether the large unit can go on the bridge or the bridge is high enough or the overpass is high enough that you can get under and those types of things it can be very intimidating the first couple of times when you're in unfamiliar places and this is why uh, I really encourage new CDL drivers to invest in those GPS units that will tell you where the low bridges and overpasses are. It can really help you out uh, in other places and whatnot. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, Jonathan, my apologies. As I said, my bad. Uh, you were using somebody's username and I, I thought it was somebody else's channel. So that's what happened. So again, my apologies about that. That was totally my bad. Okay. Uh, Philly owner operator opportunities I live near food centers in Philly I would say it's international ships from China Latin America uh, come in containers anywhere it's uh, busy for CDL drivers excellent uh, every day excellent okay and AJ said he's in New York he's taking his CDL license in April in New York so uh, AJ are you feeling fairly comfortable about your test in a couple of weeks there you feel like you're just about ready for that okay uh, Juke, uh, Pimo, I'm a new driver in New York City and I hate those entering exits on the same lane of the expressways. I have my road test at the end of the month. Yes, uh, Pimo, I can definitely understand you, when you have an on-ramp and an off-ramp that are one and the same. So you don't, you have the acceleration lane and the deceleration lane are one and the same thing. And we still have one of those in Kamloops actually and I might go up and do a video on them because they are beginning to eliminate those because they found out that they're incredibly dangerous because cars are trying to accelerate out onto the freeway as well as cars trying to decelerate so it can be very confusing because of you know mixing up the two things and not separating those out so that can be pretty tough okay okay uh Okay, uh, Muhammad, any tips to avoid getting into jinx where multiple lanes merging to interstate? Uh, Muhammad, do you have a address of somewhere that I could look up on Google Maps and I'd be able to give you more information? Uh, just leave a comment down there. Okay, uh, there we go. Cody, my hands get sweaty while driving. Should I wear gloves if I need to? <laughs> uh, no, Cody, you, you'll be fine. Uh, maybe you know just wipe your hands before you start driving and those types of things and make sure you got your fingers in the spokes so you're not slipping on this on the wheel and those types of things uh, I I'm not a big fan of gloves I know some people are but uh, I'm not a big fan so yeah that could be something that you could do as well uh, all right so CDL license so let's just talk quickly about CDL license and doing a CDL test there are five components to CDL tests uh, turning shifting pre-trip inspection as we were talking about here on the channel and I made a mistake 
uh, pre-trip inspection and then backing and coupling the unit and backing is going to be a minor component depending on the license center where you go some licensing centers will just be backing the unit up 50 feet in a straight line other uh, test centers will be parallel parking which is a lot more complicated so it depends on the test center where you're taking your test so the five components of a CDL test shifting or sorry, turning, shifting, pre-trip inspection. Those are the big three that you need to demonstrate for the purposes of a road test. For a tractor trailer license, you have 45 minutes to complete a pre-trip inspection. If it's a bus or straight truck, uh, you have 30 minutes. And if it's a class four vehicle, a small bus, then you have uh, 20 minutes to complete your pre-trip inspection for the purposes of your CDL exam. All right, and then the two minor things, and as I said, hooking and unhooking the unit and uh, hooking the unit uh, PDA public displays of affection pin dollies airline you want to hook it up in the same order same sequence every time and you want to hook it in the same order so unhooking is lap landing gear airlines pin and you want to do that in the same order every time because otherwise if you miss a step or you do something out of sequence when you're hooking a tractor trailer or a semi trailer up to a tractor unit uh, you could rip the airlines off or drop the trailer on the ground and they get very excited when you do those sorts of things so try and get a sequence in place and do it in the same order every time okay and then backing up and if you have skills uh, if you're having trouble with backing up a tractor trailer unit it just takes more space but all of the principles in terms of backing up a trailer for a tractor trailer unit are the same as they are for a pickup truck and a trailer it's just and if you can if you can get a bit more experience with a truck and a trailer it's going to translate and be a transferable skill to a tractor trailer unit you just need more space all of the principles are the same okay so that's going to help you out um, okay so AJ a lot of places in New York City have to stop before merging on okay so AJ when you say that you have to stop before you merge on to the interstate or highway how far back are you merging? Is it are you stopping because there isn't an acceleration lane, such as the picture that I showed in the in the presentation? There is that the reason? Okay, Tommy, <laughs> Tommy, you have great stories from your driving career. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've got lots of stories for sure. Uh, Jonathan, after I drop my kids off from school, there's a lane where people get off the highway, and it's the same one where you have to get on for the acceleration lane. I hate it because any chance. Yeah, uh, yeah, Jonathan, those are beginning to, you know, engineering and road crews, they're beginning to phase those out because they are dangerous and I don't, I don't like them either. Our vehicles might come and you have to get on as is also a straight lane that merged with the road. You have to get on it and sometimes obstruct traffic behind you. Okay, Joe, how do you determine the speed of off-ramp exit if you don't see the speed limit sign? Just ask him because one time I had almost to slam the brakes on because the turn was really tight. Uh, generally, Joe, when you're getting off on an off ramp, follow the cautionary signs. If you're not familiar with the off ramp, with the deceleration lane and the off ramp getting off the interstate or highway or motorway, if you're not familiar with it, obey the cautionary signs because there will be cautionary signs telling you what the speed is. And the first time, just obey those cautionary signs, especially if you're driving a larger vehicle, because if you're driving a larger vehicle and you don't follow those signs, <laughs> there are lots of videos here on YouTube of trucks, uh, RV units, and those types of things that just flop over, because that will happen. So make sure that you follow the cautionary signs for the first couple of times before you kind of get used to it and are familiar with it. And then, you know, maybe you can go a little bit faster. Okay, uh, spell socks. What's the best way to get through a double parked car on a skinny one-way street? Uh, <laughs> that, that is a good question and that is a good conundrum. I mean, sometimes you might just have to wait until the person comes back. But, I mean, you're obviously talking in a busy downtown rur urban you know, environment where there's lots of cars around and those types of things. I mean, the other thing is, is if there aren't any pedestrians around, you might have to drive up on the sidewalk and whatnot. If it's for the purposes of a road test though, definitely don't drive up on the sidewalk. You're just gonna have to wait. Uh, so hopefully they're not gonna be too long, okay? Uh, if there's no sign on the deceleration lane by chance, you might slow down with caution and be prepared to stop whenever necessary once you get off. Yeah, and you wanna, if there's no sign, yeah, you want to look as far ahead as you can and try and figure out what the road's going to do and those types of things. 
Okay, uh... Now, the other thing I want to stress for those of you going for CDL licenses, because it seems that a few people are in fact going for CDL licenses, when you are merging, as I said, if you have a loaded vehicle, I know here in BC, uh, when we take people for road tests in uh, tractor trader units, uh, that uh, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. The, the truck is 70% loaded. Now, I don't know if the trucks are, are they have a load on them, for those of you training in New York City. Uh, in New, the state of New York and other places in the United States of America. But if you're driving a loaded vehicle and you're trying to get out onto the highway and you're trying to merge, then uh, put your four-way flashes on and work on getting as much speed as you can. Uh, and then that way other traffic knows that you're trying to get up to speed. You're going to merge out onto the freeway and the four-way flashes will get driver's attention to try and make a hole for you so that you can get out on there with as much speed as possible. Because the more speed you can get getting out onto the highway in a big truck, it's going to be safer for you. And I can tell you from my experience of driving heavy trucks, uh, in the 1990s I was pulling garbage out of Toronto into Michigan. Uh, we were running 130,000 pounds, six axle garbage trailers. These things were really heavy. And you know, oftentimes we wouldn't get 40, 50 kilometers an hour when we got out onto the freeway. So you had to leave your four-way flashes on for a long time. Now, most of North America has the practice that if large commercial vehicles are traveling less than 60 kilometers an hour, they do in fact uh, activate their four-way flashes. So everybody, this is good information for everybody that if you see a tractor trailer unit uh, that has its four-way flashes on, often know that it's gonna be traveling less than 40 miles an hour or 60 kilometers an hour on the highway and it's going to be going slower okay so know that uh <laughs> spell sucks honking like a psycho doesn't work that's awesome thanks rick i'm just asking because honking like a psycho doesn't work no in fact it doesn't does it spell uh that just doesn't work it's pretty funny okay uh hall phase is it possible to get from canada uh, all the way to Colombia in South America. Actually, I believe it is possible to drive all the way from Canada to South America haul phase. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can. Oh, Philly, in PA, in the Pennsylvania, uh, most merge lanes are to your left, which is good as you can view the left mirror. Okay, excellent. Jonathan says, I wouldn't honk like crazy because you never know if someone driving might not like it and they might get into a road rage. Yeah, there's always the possibility of road rage if you're honking at other people. Uh, Joe, thanks, Rick. Uh, Jonathan, I love learning how to improve my driving skills. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joe. And we're really happy that we could help out. And we're getting near the end here. I'll tell you one more story about large vehicles, RV units, trucks, and buses. 13 feet, six inches in the United States of America in Imperial, and it's 4.15 meters in metric. And I was in Boston, was I in Boston? Yes, I was in Boston, and I was delivering furniture to schools, three elementary schools. So these young kids, young teenagers came out and they were helping unload the furniture. I don't know what happened, but anyway, they were there. And so what, it, what happened was, is the woman who was in charge, she said, well, listen, I'm just gonna drive my car and you can follow me to the two other schools that we have to deliver to. And I said, okay. So, and I said to her, I said, remember, 13 feet, six inches. You, if there's a bridge or overpass and it doesn't say 13 feet, six inches, I can't go under there, okay? And I'm gonna have to figure out how to go somewhere else. So the kids are in the, in the, in the truck helping me unload. And while they were doing that, we were kind of, singing this song we're like 13 feet six inches or it crunches your truck you know so we made up this funny song and the kids in the truck and anyway it all turned out it was all fine i followed her to the two other schools we got the the truck unloaded and we're at the last school and so we're unloading the chairs at the last school and 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 this truck goes by on the back of a wrecker and the front of the trailer is all crunched in. So obviously he'd hit a low bridge or overpass or something. And the kid looks at me and he goes, well, I guess he didn't know his truck was 13 feet, six inches. <laughs> so it was pretty funny that I had educated this kid about how tall in fact the truck was. And it was just this really funny that this trailer had gone by with the front all crunched in. So uh, hall phase, some people say yes, some people say no. Uh, you know what you do, Hall Phase? Type it into Google Maps and see what comes up on Google Maps there. John, I'm late. No, Hall Phase, 13 feet, 
six inches. So 13 and a half feet is the maximum in the United States. For you in Canada, it's 4.15 meters. If it's not four, if the sign doesn't say 4.15 meters, don't go under it, okay? John, I definitely need a conversion map. No, you don't need a conversion map. You just need to know 4.15 meters, 13 feet, six inches. That's all you need to know, okay? <laughs> there we go. All right, so if you're watching on the replay, consider subscribing to Smart Drive Test. Hit that thumbs up button as well. Leave a comment down in the comment section there. And I want to thank Jonathan. I want to thank Colin for showing up. And I want to thank Corey for all their help and answering questions, getting the videos up. Uh, none of this is possible here on the live stream without everybody's help, everybody's participation. It just it makes the live stream really great. And we're helping people out here as well. And uh, just mentioned the defensive driving course. Look down in the description there. It's on sale over the Smart Drive Test website for $17. Uh, if you don't want to get the course, definitely head over there and pick up the defensive driving checklist, and that will help you out as well. We'll talk to you later, Hall Face. Thanks very much for showing up and your questions, and uh, we'll help you out with uh, and helping out with your questions and uh, you know making everybody uh, smarter drivers. Okay. Uh, Joe, yes, I have watched Canada's Worst Drivers, and I just, I, uh, I'm just in shock. It's, I can't really watch it too much. All right, uh, so we're gonna wrap up there. Congratulations to all the smart drivers that have passed the road test in the last couple of weeks. Congratulations with that. Be sure to head over to the Smart Drive Test website and uh, register with the 100K campaign. And if you're going for a road test in the next couple of weeks, uh, con uh, good luck with that, and all the best. And John, I'll just look at John's comment here. I know someone who passed a police on the city roads that says 50 at 72 kilometers an hour in one day and was not stopped by police. Yeah, sometimes that happens, especially if the police are at the end of their shift. Uh, they're just, you know, it's not going to work out. Uh, Cody, love the stream, Rick. See you next time. You're the best. Thanks so much, Cody. You're awesome, too. And uh, all the best with everybody. So congratulations, everybody who's passed the test in the last week or two. All the best for those of you going for that. And all the best to all of the smart drivers out there. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great day. Bye now.